Hi everyone and welcome back to another episode of Angie Speaks. So today we're going to be discussing a really interesting portion of British history. We're going to be having a chat about raves, drugs, counterculture and leftist politics. So strap in and remember to stay hydrated. Britain, 1989. It's the height of Thatcherism, and the country is more polarised than ever. The Iron Lady is about to celebrate 10 years of political power, and the country is intoxicated on promises of economic mobility and a growing middle class. In London, yuppies abound. Men and women in suits with large cell phones and BMWs celebrate their economic prosperity with lavish soirees and gaudy consumerism. It is the era of the individual. Some socialists seem to believe that people should be numbers in a state computer. We believe they should be individuals. We're all unequal. No one, thank heavens, is quite like anyone else, however much the socialists may pretend otherwise. And we believe that everyone has the right to be unequal. As corporate and financial power began to assert itself, workers' unions were smashed, the Berlin War fell, and the end of history, the victory of capitalism, is declared as an edict from heaven. Greed is good. Greed and self-interest are the only true forms of altruism. Greed is what makes the world go round. For those on the margins of this bubble, the world felt less like an orgy of excess and more like the cold and brutal dystopias described in J.G. Ballard novels. Thatcher's embrace of rapid neoliberalism worked to impoverish large sections of Britain, creating a permanent underclass through strict austerity and the gutting of vital industries, especially in the north of England. The working class people of Britain were under siege as the Thatcherites waged an unrelenting class war against the poor. Political apathy and despair were the affects of this era as Britain embraced more and more extreme forms of capitalist excess. Despite the apathy that gripped the country, the cultural soil was ripe for a new wave to emerge, one fueled by a deep ecstatic need for freedom and authentic macro-social and transpersonal experience. Rave was born. Spontaneous Dionysian revelry acted as a much-needed antidote to the misery caused by Thatcher's decade-long political regime and the increasing hostility and precarity of modern life. Early rave culture was not actually a political response against the status quo. It was actually something that arose organically. The spontaneous DIY vibe is proof that it wasn't something that was contrived. It was more something that just fell together as a response to the political zeitgeist at the time. This is what differentiates it from other previous subcultures that came before. It became a culture adjacent to the mainstream and the political elements developed unconsciously as an antidote to the alienation and despair people were experiencing. 
There was no single type of raver. The culture was a mishmash of everyone from indie kids to football hooligans. The most political thing about raves was actually the chaos that they were birthed from. Something ancient and primal stirred in Thatcher-era Britain. Something that threatened to expose the social and economic hellscape that lingered beneath the surface of British life. Something akin to the Dionysian orgies of ancient Rome erupted and caused a frenzy of youth culture, music, drugs, and carnal pleasure. For those of you who don't know, Dionysus is the Greek god of intoxication and revelry. In ancient Rome, he was known as Bacchus. These rites of ecstasy are ancient expressions of a deep human urge that modern society attempts to repress. The rave scene was a sort of spontaneous anarchism, and there's a lot of anarchic practice and philosophy in the way raves were constructed and enjoyed. For instance, raves were actually spontaneously occurring events that were usually held in public spaces like abandoned buildings, warehouses, or out in fields and parks. Where do you think the genre house got its name or garage got its name? These names came from the environments where these things occurred. The special thing about it though, is that profit was not the primary motive. Having a really great time was. In order for these events to occur, they relied heavily on individual participation and mutual aid, mainly because there was no real corporate structure operating behind the scenes, and the events were mostly held illegally outside the jurisdiction of the state. In order to avoid hassle from law enforcement, there were a myriad of precautions taken collectively to ensure the safety and fun of all who attended. From secret locations, to voluntary security and medical aid, and in some cases, the free proliferation of drugs. Raves were created to induce a myriad of intoxicating sensory experiences that eventually culminate in a loss of self. Ravers described the experience of pulsating music, drug-induced bliss, and repetitive movement as a doorway into more altruistic, and loved up forms of consciousness, ones that erode the barrier between self and other. It is no accident that in the era where individualism started to invade the zeitgeist of Britain, and the alienation that resulted from this created new forms of social erosion. Rave culture's hyper-focus on the loss of self and the embrace of the transpersonal dimensions of human consciousness resonated deeply with those dissatisfied with the status quo. The free rave movement was an example of how fun, entertainment, revelry, and even the expansion of consciousness could function perfectly well outside of the jurisdiction of finance and the state. It also demonstrated the human ability to cooperate and use non-vertical power structures and mutual aid in order to pull off complicated operations. Rave culture became a mini society within the consensus society with its own conventions, rituals and regulations, all counter to the prevailing societal affects of rigid control and the glorification of authoritarianism. The organization behind these events was precise and highly structured. The event organizers would not have been able to pull it off without immense focus, discipline, and foresight. The lack of a brutal security culture in pre-9-11 Europe allowed for the relative ease of free movement of drugs throughout the scene. And this was pretty disturbing to law enforcement. It didn't really take very long for authorities to catch wind of this undercurrent and soon after, a brutal campaign of subversion and terror ensued. There was a widespread panic within the establishment about the prolific nature of the rave scene, and the authorities were deeply frightened by the idea of a freewheeling, drug fueled youth culture that operated outside of the jurisdiction of any kind of watchful body. 
the 1990 Entertainment Act and the 1994 Criminal Justice Act attempted to make it more difficult for organizers to hold raves and the police began to violently crack down on these events. The media began a shitstorm of anti-rave propaganda and heavily publicized some of the drug-related deaths that occurred in the rave scene to cause a sense of moral panic among the mainstream. We were telling you about gigantic outdoor raves happening across the region almost every weekend. Sometimes they ended in confrontations with the police after residents complained of deafening music in the small hours of the morning. This summer, all has been quiet. Too quiet, say party organisers who accuse the police of using new legislation to try to stamp out the craze altogether. Some events, such as this one in Surrey, attended by around 10,000 people, ended in violence. Within two or three weeks, um, it became very apparent that uh, there was a strong criminal element, in particular the trafficking of drugs, that uh, was motivating these parties. Just a little witchy caveat here. Um, this is Angie Speak, so of course I'm going to talk about some weird shit. It is my belief that when you dance with Dionysus, you reach an ecstasy that can almost border on madness. Yes, Dionysian energy is about ecstasy, but it also has a darker side. In ancient Rome, the Bacchanals were sensual affairs, but they were also very violent. It was understood that these darker aspects were part of the human experience, and one could choose to join in the revelry at their own peril. It's kind of similar to the risk of riding a roller coaster. It's not really likely that you'll die, but there is always that slight probability that you could, which is what makes it fun. The brutal pushback against the rave scene bordered the absurd. There was a clause in the 1994 Criminal Justice Act that gave police permission to shut down events that featured music that's characterized by the emission of a succession of repetitive beats, which is basically the most cringily British thing I've ever heard in my life. Just why was the establishment so spooked by the notion of people entering trance states and having transpersonal experiences? Maybe because this went against the ethos of the Britain they were trying to create, one that worshipped the individual and the accumulation of personal wealth. Raves are an anarchic force that subverted the ethos of the British establishment, and this could not be tolerated. There were a series of brutal police raids on illegal raves. People were arrested and did serious jail time. Drugs were seized and sound systems were destroyed. The state's violence was met with pushback from the rave community in the form of riots and protests. Around this time was when the rave scene started to have an explicitly political edge. Squatters, anarchists, football hooligans, hippies, and even some bored yuppies got together and created a campaign against the 1994 Criminal Justice Act. The authorities responded brutally because they were witnessing the capacity of a counterculture to self-organize and assemble hundreds and thousands of people without any help from a major institution. Remember, this was all pre-internet and pre-iPhone. There were many coalitions that were created, including the Advance Party and the Freedom Network, and these organisations basically went out and organised a bunch of campaigns to get people together, organised demos and coaches to bring people into the major cities of the UK to fight against this unjust bill. All the tension culminated in a huge riot called the Battle of Park Lane. The police clashed with activists in a violent brawl that served to worsen the image of the rave scene in the British public imagination. The criminal justice bill was passed a year later, and not only did it kill the free rave scene, it also introduced laws like stop and frisk, and also a myriad of other repressive measures. 
There are also whisperings about the drug ketamine being introduced into the rave scene by the feds in order to weaken the movement and erode the social bonds that helped create it. The rave scene was killed in its prime and a new corporately controlled club scene took its place. The establishment understood that there was money to be made from exploiting the need for youth culture, but they wanted to control these expressions of revelry. The freedom and spontaneity of the rave scene was now under the jurisdiction of business and the state, which robbed it of all of its sinful allure. Nowadays, the rave scene still exists to a degree, but at risk of sounding like a fucking shitty Gen Xer, I'm not a Gen Xer by the way, the magic is gone. There are so many rigid laws now that prohibit free organization and it's incredibly difficult to organize something in this kind of terrain. There are still whisperings here and there, but not too many places for that Dionysian energy to emerge unbridled by the concerns of polite society. Expensive drinks, shitty drugs, cops everywhere, it all kind of kills the vibe. Nowadays, the institutionalization of revelry is the norm, and it is a lot more difficult to organize a rave that has no ties to corporate structure or without bureaucratic permission. There are those who still fight and attempt to use the UK's squatting laws as a way of getting around the rigid bureaucracy and law enforcement, but this is not always successful. In cases where it is, people are still able to create authentic experiences, even if just for a brief burst. There is still major clashes with law enforcement, raids and destruction, which can often make the rave environments feel tense and at odds with its original ethos. It's a sad, sad tale about how the state fucks up everything that's truly free and truly beautiful. Am I saying that we should bring back the 90s? No, I'm not. I was a fetus in the 90s. I also think the fashion kind of sucked too. Do I think that there are lessons that can be learned from this brief glimpse into the past? Yes, I do, especially for anarchists. The thing that made the rave scene so unique was its anarchic structure and the fact that it was centered around pleasure and participation. It then eventually grew into something potently political. Too much of our organization and image on the radical left is centered around serious discourse and activism. And although these things are really great, I mean, they do tend to scare away the average person. I honestly don't think that it would hurt to inject some of that Dionysian energy back into the fold. Not only is it healthy to experience ecstasy, it also helps create communities, cohesive ones with really strong social bonds. One of the main issues with the rave scene was that it was purely chaotic energy, devoid of any specific political goal or direction. This is the reason that it was so easily subverted by the state. I believe that revelry and ecstasy are some of the most potent aspects of the human condition, that when harnessed correctly can bring about new dimensions of consciousness that lead to societal and political change. This chaotic element has attempted to rise in many forms through the 20th and 21st century, but the establishment has always thwarted it. I think it is very possible for us to summon these forces once again and marry them to a coherent political vision. Let the Gnostic madness that lives at the center of the dance floor lead us to a fluorescent utopia. Thanks so much for watching this guys and I hope you enjoyed it and found it informative. Um, if you like what I do, feel free to like, subscribe, follow me on Twitter. And if you would like to help support the channel, uh, I have a link to my Patreon down in the description. 
I would like to thank all of my Patreons uh, for helping make all of this possible. You guys are the best. Um, and I would also like to say thank you to everybody who's subscribed recently. I have 6,000 subscribers now, which is really insane considering that I've only been at this for about, like, I think seven months or something. Uh, so thank you guys so much, um, and I hope that we can continue having these fun journeys together. I was a fetus in the 90s. Um, yeah, I was born in 1994, so I didn't even exist when any of this stuff was going on. Uh, but if any of you in the audience were actually around during that time and you have stories that you want to share or things that you want to add, I would really love to uh, read your comments. I, I'm like super interested in this period of history, so feel free to, to share as much as you want. Thanks for watching and I shall see you later.